homicides. So the violence has gone down a bit. Um, 2010, 3,800 people were killed. So you see the numbers. Do you, you had mentioned 420,000 left. Do you, know, do you have any idea where they, I mean, 60,000 went to El Paso. I'm assuming quite a few went through Dona Ana County, not just Las Cruces. So. Yes, and, and, right. and it's really hard to know because a lot of the people that left don't want anybody to know where right. they went to. So that's a massive population. Yeah. So perhaps 400,000 became uh, undocumented uh, immigrants into the USA? Would they have gone into interior Mexico or would they all have head, headed north? Uh, um, we don't know. Um, a lot of people did end up in El Paso and um, you said undocumented, but we also need to realize that a lot of these people who moved to the United States were actually or are actually US citizens. Okay. They were born in El Paso, but they were living in Juarez. Okay. I had a question on the 10,000 um, businesses that closed. Were the, were, was that a combination on both sides of the border, or was that just in Juarez? In Juarez. And so then you were saying, as a result, the new businesses were starting to open up on in El Paso. Okay, some of the findings that we, that we heard when we started to listen to the children, to the students talk to us during the focus groups, uh, were the separation of families, stories about death, and the constant reminder of violence in, in everyday things. And um, the, the separation of children, the, what was going on was that the parents were so concerned for the safety of their kids that they started to send their kids to El Paso. So they would stay in Juarez and, make, and continue to make a living, but they would send their kids to to tios, the, the aunts, the uncles, um, family members who were already in El Paso or in other parts of the United States. And Ms. Um, Ornelas, who is a teacher, told us, los papás ya no los quieren tener allá, they don't want them over there anymore, and they send them with the, with the grandparents, with the uncles, with the aunts. We heard a lot of stories about this, so we heard the, the kids telling us um, how they would be sitting in a restaurant and all of a sudden they hear the shots so they don't go down under and on the floor. Uh, money extortions, kids told us about parents who were getting extorted. Some of them had to close their business because they were asking for money. Um, kidnappings and let me see if I don't have an example to share with you. but. Um, um, they saw constant reminders of the violence in their everyday things. Uh, Maria talks about riding in a camioneta in the truck and how it still smelled like blood. They had cleaned it up and they had upholstered it, but it still smelled like blood and, and the truck still had a bullet hole in the, in the belt of the seatbelt. So they, they, the way they talked about it though was like if it was the norm. It was so normal to them now that, oh, todavía huele sangre. It still smells like blood, but we still go riding in it. <laughs> because somebody they knew was killed in that truck? Right. Yes. How did you build um, a connection with these children so that they were comfortable with sharing these stories with you? I think it was that we, we spent one whole year just as participant observation in the classroom. We just spent it with them in the class, um, talking with them, helping them out, um, uh, just sitting there. And eventually, the more they saw us in the class, the more they were wanting to talk to us and ask us, who are you, what are you doing here? And the more we would share with them, the more they, they created that rapport with us. Eventually, it got to the point where if they had a question, they would come and ask us, <laughs> instead of asking the teacher. They would ask the teacher, but they would also feel comfortable enough to ask us the questions. And I think that created that rapport to where they were able to open up. Although, in listening to the stories, I'm not sure if it would have mattered who it was they were telling. Um, and one little girl told us, Miss, tenemos mucho que decir. We have a lot to tell you. Um, I'm sure that they were probably very willing to just talk about it. It seemed like they just wanted to talk. Yes? Would you, you mentioned this before. I feel like this is an important part probably of the research. I, I could be just rejecting, but, um, but would you say that students became desensitized to the violence or the violence just became normalized? 
Because I, I feel like there's a difference between the two. Yeah, I don't think they became decent. I think that the violence just became And I think, and now, one of the things that we are looking at now as we analyze the data is the, the difference between the male students and the female students. The female students talked about it with horror. Um, the male students, while they still didn't like it, they seem to almost glorify, in a sense, what was happening. Um, they talked about, we had one kid, he was in third grade, who talked to the principal and he was telling the principal, when I grow up, I want to be a sicario, a hitman. Uh, so they were almost like um, glorifying it. And they were, and I'll share later in my findings of a kid who had a narco corrido journal. So it was this book, it was a journal, but instead of having things that he wrote in it, he had um, the letters to narco corridos. So he just... The lyrics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> does that answer your question? It does. Okay. It does. Uh, we also found for, um, some forms of resistant capital. Um, they were almost like survival strategies that they were learning in Juarez to help them survive the violence. Um, and I use Yoso's work to define resistant capital, and she talks about it as a knowledge and skills cultivated through behavior that challenges inequality. Although, the further we started to talk about it in, the, in our team, and the more we analyzed the data, we started to really wonder if it was a form of resistant capital, or if there was just the students talking about, or how the parents were talking about it in the home. Um, they were talking about, um, mi mamá dice que también los presidentes, my mom says that the presidents are the ones that are fragile, and they're the ones that are, that are the bad guys, right? Que también apoyan a los que hacen cosas, y que también cuando pasa algo, los soldados lo están viendo, y hacen como que no lo ven. So they were very aware that those people in positions of power were the ones that were perpetuating the violence, were the ones that were perpetuating the cycle of narcotráfico and they were getting a lot from it themselves. Um, we're, we're not sure if they really understood this and saw, and were using it as resistant capital, or if they were just repeating what they were hearing at home from the parents. So this is something that we need to look further into. Um, resistant capital means what? Uh, resistant capital means knowledge and skills cultivated through behavior to challenge inequality. Because they were saying stories about, well, yeah, but those people in positions of power are the ones who are perpetuating this. But we're not sure if they really understood that or if they were just uh, repeating what the parents were saying. Uh, we also found a sense of responsibility towards families left behind. A lot of them saw themselves as having, like it was their duty to do good in school so that they could um, so that they could uh, help those who were left in bodies to come to the United States. One little girl, Alexa, <coughs> she's a U.S. citizen, and uh, her family was in bodies, and she was sharing with us, like, her whole family is waiting for her to turn 21.